Karl Lagerfeld is arguably the world's best modern designer, having a career spanning decades and reviving many brands single-handedly in the process. But why then did his own namesake brand go the way that it did? A shell of its former self and by far the least respected of his work. By the time Carl began his namesake label in 1984 with this Autumn Winter 84 ready to wear collection that was produced under a licensing deal with Biedermann, he was already one of the most respected designers in the world, having seen enormous successes through the last decade at Chloe, before that at Jean Patou, now Fendi, and had just shown his first collection at Chanel. His namesake debuted with this collection to apparent great success, as it was an offering very different to his loose 70s centric looks at Chloe, harder looks at Chanel, and fur heavy looks at Fendi. This was inspired by Carl directly, featuring lots of suiting details and a closer fit to the body that at the time read as racy. From here, the brand had hit after hit in their collections. It was a genuinely well received addition to the Fashion Week circuit that was taken as a strong creative expression with an early, obviously very 80s, aesthetic. The collections became known for their mostly just black and white colour palette, very signature Carl colours, and their focus on shirts and dresses with the odd showpiece or different garment here and there. For cultural context, obviously because of Carl's work at the other houses, he was a very, very visible designer, there's no doubt about that. But his work at Chanel and at Fendi, and still his past work at Chloe, far surpassed the fame of his own namesake in the public, despite how extremely well received it was by the fashion press. In my head, this is a little bit like how Jonathan Anderson's mainline JW Anderson is just not as famous or as discussed as Loewe's, but still maintains a very strong following. That's to say, though it may have been eclipsed by his groundbreaking revival of all the Chloe, Fendi, and Chanel houses, and Patou to a lesser extent, it was still very successful, and by 1987, the Karl Lagerfeld brand began looking outwards for licensing collaborations to capitalise on its popularity. This came with a collection with Revillon, who would produce furs under the Karl Lagerfeld name to make the most of his success with the Fendi brand. This came along with this fashion show in the winter, along with the ready-to-wear show that he was already producing for his mainline in the spring. According to the New York Times, the Karl Lagerfeld for Revillon show was the absolute standout for the whole season, specifically for his fur manipulation techniques which were already famed from his 20 years at Fendi, which we talked about in this video. Revillon at this point had also been a massive influence in fashion for many years, even as far back as 1839 when they were founded. But they'd previously gone defunct in 1982 and were under new ownership, Hence why I think Carl, Caroline Herrera and Louis Ferreau were bought on for their own lines in 1987. They included at least both ready-to-wear and fur collections, likely as a way for them to regain some relevance within the fashion world. Carl and Revillon seemingly went very well together. They were stocked by Saks Fifth Avenue and were really considered amongst the luxury brands in furs at a time when at Carl Lagerfeld's namesake brand, his designs were growing to a more 90s aesthetic, slowly but surely, in his own manner, of course. Never really doing anything groundbreakingly new, but making genuinely good quality clothes for each season that also related very well to the brand's image. In this case, being shirt and dress heavy in a white and black and maybe a pop of colour colour palette, quite a lot of hats, though they were less and less as the seasons regressed, and they had a decent emphasis on jackets. This was relayed through a storyline, individual to each collection, as was the fashion at the time, with one developed with influence from biker culture, another one from 18th century France, just as some examples. Each to a receptive audience, never really having a bad collection, it was considered to be a very strong luxury design house and often discussed in fashionable circles, specifically because it was Karl Lagerfeld's namesake brand and that carried heft. The partnership with Revillon lasted a respectable five years until eventually the brand, or the rights to the Karl Lagerfeld name, was sold in 1992 with a licensing deal to a then Dunhill Holdings PLC that would merge to become Vendôme in 1993. Vendôme was the parent company to Cartier, Montblanc, Alfred Dunhill, and importantly, Chloe, who Carl had just signed to become the head designer of once again after so famously reviving the brand in the early 70s. 
It was in this deal that Lagerfeld insisted that they purchase the rights to the name Karl Lagerfeld back from Revillon, which then saw that Vendôme began to produce clothes, shoes, handbags, and jewelry for the brand under a licensing deal. However, sales soon began to stagnate, which in my opinion is because of lack of creative curation. Yes, Karl is a phenomenal designer, but looking through these many collections that is online, it's hard to realize a real through line that one could come back to for customers. Even the best artist in the world needs a curator to bring their creations into a marketable place to sell to customers. So without this, honestly, it felt like these designs were just a little more directionless than his work at the other houses. It also seems that this was Carl's takeaway too, because he claimed that they didn't really have the correct leadership from a business perspective, and that he was dissatisfied with the way the company was run. Even Ralph Toledano, the man at the business helm of the Carl Lagerfeld brand since 1985, left the company in 1995. So it's safe to say that it wasn't a great relationship between the two, and the brand and partner had a less than amicable parting as Carl's five-year Chloe contract came to an end. The rights were sold directly back to Carl for a singular franc, as a sort of burn for them having this bad divide because they were claiming the brand was so worthless to them as a partner. Carl then took this for fuel, as they really took an unexpected turn by rebranding the whole company as Lagerfeld Gallery in 1998. And I think, though I may be wrong, they signed a licensing agreement with Staff International for production of clothes and perhaps the marketing side as well, as the sources are a little unclear. I find this particularly interesting because he has always said in many interviews that he is not a marketeer. He leaves that to other people, he only does the design, it's just not his job. Hence why I think a licensing brand was perfect for him, for his company. They dealt with all of the things that he didn't want to deal with and he could be left to do the design. That being said, it was at this time that the structure of the business seemingly was put into question as they, as part of this rebranding, I believe stopped showing up Fashion Week briefly and evolved the company into a more lifestyle brand with the opening of a shop, also called Lagerfeld Gallery, on 20 Rue de Seine in Paris that opened also in 1998. Never intending the Lagerfeld Gallery brand to be a big business, here, he would sell books, prints of his own photography, Fendi clothing, including Fendi First in the winter, and the aforementioned line of clothing, which unfortunately I couldn't find pictures of. So, this really became a change for the namesake. It continued to be his design in the purest form, but now totally undeterred by the sales or marketing side that of course affected his work at Chanel, Fendi, Chloe, etc. That was until Staff International was purchased by the OTB Group, the company that owns Diesel, in 2000. It seems that they saw more potential in the business to be this extremely exclusive label, and so still in the year 2000, they opened a slightly larger lifestyle brand store in Monaco, set to sell men's, women's, children's fashions in both ready-to-wear and couture, accessories, fashions, shoes and bags from what I'm assuming is multiple brands, not just Lagerfeld Gallery. They also took the brand back to the catwalk in spring 2001 with this collection that reintroduced the brand's shirts and ties, but in a significantly younger fashion with much less black to also suggest a joyfulness of the brand, and sunglasses as an obvious nod to Carl. This collection effectively redefined the brand's vision for now a third time in a way that both differentiated it from his other brands and yet was still very commercial. It of course was a hit, and through the next few collections, it was clear that the Lagerfeld Gallery brand had a footing in the industry, even showing a clear predecessor to the infamous Chanel hoop bag in 2002, 11 years before the Chanel bag debuted in spring 2013. By 2002, they were once again a force in the industry, and thanks to Renzo Rosso, the man that owns the OTB group, they were about to come into massive influence with a collaboration with Diesel at the absolute height of their fame and influence in the denim world, which if you do want more information on, I have a whole video about Diesel here. This collaboration was really huge at the time, featured heavily in the Autumn Winter 2002 collection, which as it came into stores in just the first week alone, had sold 90% of the clothes. 
both have spoken positively on the collaboration, and it was really the big introduction of the Lagerfeld Gallery brand to audiences that weren't as fashion savvy as those that knew of the brand already, in a way that commodified Karl Lagerfeld's designs to the masses really for the first time ever. Before this, he was a very high fashion designer, and now everyone could get their hands on a little piece of Karl. In this interview, he explains that he wanted a line to be more accessible to people, not too expensive, and as he is a popular designer, something for people to get into that world without having to pay what they cannot afford. Here is really where we see the birth of the brand's ethos that we know of it today. No longer was it beautifully made clothes at the absolute tip-top highest quality. Now, this was a brand for everyone. Effectively, this partnership transformed the brand again from high fashion to a diffusion line, without it actually being a diffusion line of anything. Karl Lagerfeld, the brand, didn't exist anymore. It had transformed into the Lagerfeld Gallery brand. They had just decided to position it this way. From here, the brand would go on to have many collaborations, including one with Disneyland Paris in 2004, in which Carl transformed his iconic look onto Donald Duck, which actually is the first time for the brand that he was characterized in this way, something that would also go on to be a signature of the label. But more notably in 2004, his biggest collaboration of his career. The collaboration with H&M. This further commodified his work to the masses in what was, at the time, a really shocking move. This was before H&M had done any of their really famous collaborations. He was literally the first successful designer to have a down-market collaboration. In fact, two decades before this, in 1983, Halston and J.C. Penney had had a collaboration, and it completely ruined his career. Bergdorf Goodman dropped him overnight, and Halston's company fell hard. So for Carl to do the seemingly impossible, a down-market collaboration from a high fashion designer, was groundbreaking. The collection sold out within two days and secured Lagerfeld Gallery's place in fashion, as well as popularizing this whole down-market collaboration trend that is still dominating this decade of high street fashion. So it's clear that now what he wanted to do for his namesake was something that was accessible to the masses. He wanted this commodification of his work, However, H&M didn't quite do it in the fashion that Carl wanted. H&M ran with a limited run, ensuring only a few in major cities around the world would actually have access to his work. He was really not happy about this and said it was both embarrassing and snobbery created by anti-snobbery. Which, unfortunately, wasn't really the end of Carl having a very different vision for his own brand than the people doing the business side. In December of 2004, the same year, the company, along with the rights to the Karl Lagerfeld name, was purchased by the Tommy Hilfiger Corporation for only 30 million US dollars. But seemingly, the relationship did not start off on the right foot. In multiple interviews, David Dyer, the CEO of the Tommy Hilfiger Corporation, stated that they wanted Lagerfeld Gallery and the Karl Lagerfeld brands to be a more upmarket offering for the company, quite exactly the opposite of what Carl wanted. Even in this same interview from before, Carl says the people that ran the business wanted to compete with Fendi, Chanel, LVMH, but he did not want that. And unlike all of his other lifelong contracts, he was actually only offered a five-year contract with the Lagerfeld Gallery brand. His first show after the acquisition was Autumn Winter 2005, and as you can see, it's now the fourth version of the company aesthetic. Definitely upmarket, lots of fur, leather, the show's visuals are much more on a high fashion side, and so it seems that his CEO's wishes were adhered to. And it wasn't long before things had to change. In 2006, they restructured the entire company, this time with the Karl Lagerfeld name as the higher-end offering and Lagerfeld Gallery staying on as the diffusion line a fifth version for the company now. The first collection of this new luxury line was actually shown along with the Lagerfeld Gallery collection in the same show, Autumn Winter 2006, which showed in New York, his first show in New York in fact, and was meant as a more glamorous offering to the brand, like a new energy. It featured both men's and women's leather and fur, but surprisingly no bags for what was meant as a luxury offering. 
They began a confusing partnership with Macy's and for the cosmetics line, a partnership with Sephora, which if you would like more information on the cosmetics line next week to go along with the video that will be on this channel, there will be a rise and potential fall of Karl Lagerfeld Cosmetics. So do make sure to subscribe over on Underskin for that. So despite the fact that this was going against what Karl actually wanted, Tommy Hilfiger clearly had huge plans for the brands. They devolved into having several lines now, including Lagerfeld Gallery, which was now supposedly their diffusion boutique line, Karl Lagerfeld, their glamorous line. They also created Lagerfeld for the contemporary man and woman and the KL Lagerfeld label in Asia, as well as countless licenses across the globe. The Tommy Hilfiger Corporation featured them heavily through their 2005 financial report and it was clear from the amount of lines that they had with Tommy Hilfiger that they had big Calvin Klein or Marc Jacobs-esque plans for the label. Along with this, in 2007, they would also launch their first denim brand, K. Karl Lagerfeld, that specifically made jeans and fitted t-shirts. So they were willing to put quite a bit of money into making this work. But this, now sixth iteration of the company, was not anywhere near as successful as it seems that they'd planned. Here is really a plateau for the company that, to be honest, saw them not do anything interesting at all. Yes, they released catwalk collections until autumn winter 2010 that were well received by magazines, but then Vogue was always going to champion the Karl Lagerfeld collections. He was a huge influence in fashion in general and they obviously would want to keep on his good side. It's just, no one else was talking much about them at all. The clothes were just average and weren't really worth talking about, but on top of that, the Tommy Hilfiger Corporation was in real turmoil. They were already struggling when they acquired Karl Lagerfeld in 2004, but things had gotten quite rough, and eventually the Tommy Hilfiger Group, which was owned by Apex Partners, was sold to Philips Van Hoosen, the parent company to Calvin Klein. The Karl Lagerfeld was actually not part of the deal and was left with very few brands to a now failing Apex Partners. I personally think this is when Karl Lagerfeld either stopped designing for the brand or significantly reduced his role in 2011 when this source says that Apex Partners relaunched the company as its now seventh iteration. Tommy Hilfiger, the man, said that they would rely heavily on the design team anyway because Carl was so thinly spread. And honestly, from this point onwards, the design at his namesake really takes a turn creatively and is undoubtedly the start of the fall of the company creatively. Because clearly money was spent for this relaunch. Creatively, we can see from their Instagram that this seventh iteration had begun to rely quite heavily on this image of Chibi Carl that characterized him in a very juvenile way, which would be fine if it was a children's brand or even targeted towards a different market. But for a brand that had always tried to be chic, this was an odd mascot to choose. Their marketing told us that this was a brand for children, or perhaps the child in all of us, such as Disney products deliver, but their actual retail offering was black, strict, and more hard edge. Effectively, there was a heavy disconnect between the actual garments, which had fallen heavily in quality to simply a high street level, and the way that they were promoting slash marketing this company. However, I am assuming that at least the business financially was still fair, because honestly, this evolution seems like it would have come just following consumer demand. They launched a web brand, Carl, in 2011. They were planning a different kind of luxury store in Paris in 2012 under the name Carl Lagerfeld Paris. They launched Netta Porter in 2012 for a diffusion line. They launched their own perfume, separate to the other Carl Lagerfeld perfumes in 2014. They named Hun Kim as the new head designer in 2014. They were also opening a fair few stores around the world, including one on Regent Street in 2014. In 2015, they launched Carl Lagerfeld Paris in a joint venture with G3. Remember that name for later a kids line in the same year and by 2016 they had amassed a real number of discount retail outlets the world over including eight in america alone with more on the way so the brand was genuinely growing carl was still the front man for the business even though han kim was the head designer as i mentioned before carl still shot their ad campaigns so it still had his seal of approval Perhaps not in the way the fashion crowd would have expected, but there was clearly a market for this Karl Lagerfeld merch line. 
especially evidence when in 2016, G3 Apparel, the owners of Donna Karen and a few other mid-tier labels, bought a 19% stake in the business as a co-enterprise with Apex. By 2017, sales at Karl Lagerfeld had doubled, revenue had reached 80 million in the US alone, and the company planned to open a further eight stores in the US in what they clearly saw as a developing market. By 2018, both Karl Lagerfeld and Lagerfeld consolidated into one Karl Lagerfeld line yet again, though with the same visuals as the seventh iteration, the Chibi iteration, and debuted in a show in Pity Womo. Though it's surprisingly hard to find footage of this, even their own YouTube page doesn't have footage of them at Pity Womo. From here, they continue to open more discount outlets, and really, the whole brand has just continued as selling Carl's celebrity merchandise more than anything else. They have their chippy logo, they have the Chupette cat imagery, who if you don't know is Carl Lagerfeld's cat. They've got their mostly black and white color palette and his name, which in fairness are all solid identifiers. But it's just a very strange evolution for a house that once started as his pure form of artistic expression. In my opinion, what the brand lacked was a strong curation. Someone to pull together all of the parts to one vision instead of going through now seven iterations of what the company could be. Carl was not interested in the marketing side, and that would be fair if he had the proper people behind it to do the marketing and the business side. So I'm honestly just surprised that Carl would allow his brand to be bastardized in this way, even if the brand didn't have his full attention. Clearly, for the marketing side, there was enormous disconnect. The clothes versus the marketing is one, but also it seemed like no one really looked at who he was and thought how they could best portray a Karl Lagerfeld brand instead of thinking how they could just milk the already established name. It seems like they never really did a value proposition for the company, and it really feels like there was not one person that sat down and thought, what is our product, what are we known for, what is the Karl Lagerfeld name known for? And how do we deliver that? And instead, somebody just decided to slap Carl's name on a bunch of t-shirts, sweatshirts, and blanks and call it a day. So instead of decent fashion offerings, we got delivered garments that truly don't give the consumer any semblance of Carl whatsoever, and honestly are just expensive printed blanks that have no relevance to the Carl Lagerfeld personal brand at all, which is obviously very confusing to the customer. Honestly, I don't understand why they ended up going in this sportswear, loungewear route at all, to be honest. Because when you think of sportswear, you think of it as something that is cool. It has that edge to it. Karl Lagerfeld is not cool. He was never cool. He was chic. It's a totally different vibe that clearly this brand just wasn't getting. I know that's fairly harsh, and there are a lot of decent businessmen in the history, especially Renzo Rosso, I think, was doing a phenomenal job back in those days. But since then, it just clearly didn't have the right leadership to succeed. And so it fell into this utter shell of what it once was, all up until Carl's death in 2019, which you would think would be the end of the brand. Really, few people seem to consider what would even happen to the company after his passing, simply because it had lost its artistic merit a really long time ago, and now with Carl dead, no one expected it to be financially viable enough to continue. But that's not where the video ends. They just kept pushing out honestly really tacky collaborations, like their continued effort with Puma that began with this campaign in 2018 that at least seemed to boost the bottom line. Even Carl in 2019 said it was doing pretty well in this podcast interview, and if only financially, it was, I suppose, doing better. In 2022, G3 acquired the remaining stake in the Carl Lagerfeld business for 210 million US dollars, a huge jump from the 30 million Tommy Hilfiger Corporation had paid, and a world apart from the symbolic franc that Carl had paid. They even claim to have a 2 billion US dollar sales plan for the company. So you would think they would have very large plans for expansion to get back a return on investment. But so far, we haven't seen much in the way of effort for this. Only the launch of Karl Lagerfeld jeans in 2022. 
The main line, though, is still pushing this merchandise-esque design that the brand is now mocked for. And honestly, I have no idea what they can do to revive the brand now. I can't see it becoming the new Calvin Klein, that market is already so heavily saturated. I can't see it turning into endless car merchandise like it is now, simply because through time, of course, his likeness will become less and less marketable. And the only other option is having another designer come in to revive the brand to being a high fashion or maybe even a high street brand again, just with less of a focus on Carl himself, which I know technically could happen, I just really doubt it. Honestly, I would imagine that the business will be kept open if only to sell the perfumes, which do continue to this day to be profitable, and perfumes, unlike garments, tend to have a lifelong customer base that could perhaps make the purchase of the company worth it for the parent company. Usually in a video, I say I'm excited to see where a company will go, but honestly, I'm not. I think perhaps the company should be put to rest or at least close the fashion side of the company because it simply cannot be the way that Carl wants to be continued after death. Thank you so much for watching this video, make sure you like it and subscribe to see next week a first for this channel. I will be doing a full life and death of the designer Carl Lagerfeld. So far the script is long long so I've got a lot of scripting, a lot of editing to do but I am really excited for it. There is just so much that I didn't know before researching that I'm planning on including about him as a person and it is so fascinating so it's a must see if you'd like to subscribe for that. Check out my beauty channel too for videos like this one but about beauty brands and check out my Patreon if you'd like to support further.